Hey everyone, it's Kenji, uh, and I'm gonna roast this chicken. So, I am usually a fan of spatchcocking, but I'm not doing that today. Um, sometimes I roast my chickens whole, sometimes I roast my turkeys whole. Spatchcocking, I think, is sort of the easiest, uh, most foolproof way, but today, I'm gonna use a method uh, that is sort of a hybrid between a method I developed at Cook's Illustrated a number of years back, actually many, many years back, so over, over a decade now, um, and a method that my, uh, my buddy Daniel Gritzer at Serious Eats uh, just published in his sort of perfect roast chicken recipe. So, um, the idea when you're roasting a chicken is that the breast meat only wants to get to around 150, 155 degrees, more than that and it dries out. The leg meat on the other hand needs to get to at least 165, 170, maybe even 180 degrees, otherwise it is tough. Um, so how do you get two different temperatures on the same bird? Well, it's not easy. Spatchcocking it is one way because then the breasts are thicker, the legs are thinner, uh, and so everything ends up cooking at the same time. The other way is to sort of blast the sides and the back with heat and less heat on the top uh, so that the legs kind of get a jump start. Um, so that's the method we're gonna use. You can do it either by preheating a pizza stone in the pizza oven um, or by using a skillet, which is what we're gonna do today. Um, so first of all, this chicken, all I've done to it is I salted it yesterday. I, I used a combination of salt and pepper. For this whole chicken, it was probably about two teaspoons of kosher salt, maybe a little bit more. You can do more or less depending on your taste, uh, along with a dusting of fresh ground pepper. I salted it on all sides as well as the inside. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a skewer. And so you see there's these sort of fat pockets on the breast and the leg. We wanna help those render out. And so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually just puncture the chicken all over those little fat deposits. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna create channels for that fat to come rendering out so that it crisps up better so that you don't have all that liquid fat kind of trapped under there and in there. It has a channel for it to escape. Probably about, I don't know, someone someone will count, I'm sure, and post in the comments, um, especially now that I said it, but I'm guessing around, I don't know, 30 or 40 punctures per uh, fat deposit for, per side. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a knife and I'm gonna cut a little slit right here A little slit right here, kind of just where the leg meets the backbone, and then a little slit up here where the, uh, the breasts kind of come in, and a little slit right there, okay? And those are also going to be little channels for fat to escape from. All right, so now I'm going to truss my bird. Trussing the bird, mainly you do it for appearance. Um, the other thing you can do is sort of help, well, what, it, the reason I'm doing it is because I'm cooking this in a cast iron pan and I want it to all kind of fit in there nicely. I'm gonna truss this the easy way, easiest way I know how. Some people will do fancier things, but I'm doing this uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by taking those wing tips. I already did this, but I'm gonna take the wing tips, tuck them back here, okay, so that the wings stay nice and uh, compact against the body. Then I'm going to take my twine and you want the leading end to be quite long, you know, a foot or two just in case because you don't want to run out of twine while you're doing this. Um, and then I'm going to tuck it under the breast there and we're going to basically wrap it all the way around the breast and then we're going to cross it on this side and tighten that up. You see, and so basically like I've pulled the breast together into like a little sack. And then, real simple, I'm going to take my end of the twine, wrap it around this leg a couple times Take the other end, make sure it's nice and tight, and then wrap it around that leg a couple times. And then, I'm gonna wrap it around both. Okay, and I'll take the other end and I'll also wrap it around both. And so, that is the simplest way I know to truss a chicken. Um, you don't have to, you know, there are fancier, fancier ways to do this. Um, I think Daniel probably has a fancier way that he does it. Um, there are much fancier ways you can do this, but I find that this is pretty effective and you don't really need to do much else. And it's something that basically anyone can do. Tie the send off so that our chicken is nice and tight and compact. All right, that's what we got. Nice, compact, tight looking chicken. One string going across the back, nothing crisscrossing or anything, and it stays put. Um, I'm gonna take some herbs. I got parsley, uh, sorry, I got sage, rosemary, and thyme. I'm just gonna shove them on in there. If you want, you know, you can do something like shove a lemon in there or put some garlic in there. Whatever, whatever you wanna shove, your, shove into your chicken, uh, you can go ahead and shove it, all right? But I'm doing some herbs. Um, really, they're just gonna kind of perfume the air around the chicken as it roasts. Um, they're, they aren't gonna end up, um, you're, you're, you're not gonna eat them in the end. Wash my hands, get rid of that chicken juice. All right, so 
I've got this cast iron pan preheating over here. I'm gonna get it nice and hot. Add a smidge of oil to it there. All right, and we're basically, at this point we're basically smoking hot. Now I'm gonna take my chicken and I'm gonna plop it on in there. The idea is I'm gonna sear this bottom side. And so what's happening now is that there's heat coming up obviously from the bottom of the chicken. It's gonna start getting these thighs, area, this thigh area cooking. That's the part you really have to worry about most is that this thigh is not gonna be done by the time the breast is done. And so what usually ends up happening, if I were to just put this on a roasting pan and throw it in the oven, what would happen is that these thighs would not be done by the time the breast is done. So you'd be forced to leave the chicken in there. And in that time, your breast is gonna end up overcooking. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm giving that bottom side of the chicken a, uh, a jump start so that by the time it goes into the oven, it'll have already started cooking and then everything will come up to temperature, finish coming up to temperature at the same time. Um, I preheated on high, now I'm over a sort of medium low. Um, if you ask me, I would say that pan temperature is prob was probably around 450 to 500 degrees when I got that chicken in there. Um, but now it qu obviously quickly dropped down. <clears throat> I'm gonna use my fish spatula just to kind of peek under here as it cooks. All right, so I am going to basically cook this on, on the side. So at this point, I'm gonna pull the chicken up and kind of prop it against the edge of the skillet there so that that thigh can start cooking. I really want the thigh part to be directly against the pan here. Um, some people will tell you that by um, trussing the chicken, you end up plumping up the breast, which makes it cook a little bit slower. Um, I don't really think that's the case. And in fact, I've found that um, trussing a chicken is generally worse as far as getting the breasts and the legs to cook at an even rate. Um, what ends up happening is that when you truss a chicken, you're really doing a lot more plumping of the legs and you're also kind of protecting uh, that inner part of the leg. So when you don't truss a chicken, the legs are kind of splayed out in a sort of pornographic way, you know? Um, and there's a lot more exposure, exposure there. So your legs actually cook faster in an untrussed chicken than in a trussed chicken. Um, so trussing actually sort of counteracts the idea uh, that you counter, counteracts the cooking, even cooking of the, of the chicken because um, it'll actually make the legs take longer to cook than the breasts. Um, however, what we're doing now is we're searing those legs so that the trussing is kind of taken out of the picture anyway. It doesn't really make much difference in the end. Um, the reason we would trust and not versus not trust is because it's pretty to trust and chickens look great when they're trust. And for, you know, sometimes presentation is great. If, if presentation is always important. You know, we, people say you eat with your eyes and it really is true um, that um, our perception of flavor, our perception of taste is something that we uh, take in from our noses, from our mouths. Um, sound plays a role in it, texture plays a big role in it, and sight also plays a big role in, you know, things that look better do taste better because our brains are easily fooled and our, you know, our tongues don't govern our brains. Our brains are governed by all of our senses and all of our old experiences and memories and all that kind of stuff. All right, so now I'm gonna get that other thigh. You don't have to worry about sort of really deeply browning it. You know, we're not going for like, normally if I was uh, say browning a chicken thigh for a braise, I would let it sit there until it's basically as dark as it can get without being black. That's sort of the goal with browning for me usually. Um, in this case, though, we're just looking to give the chicken, those parts of the chicken, a head start. So we don't need it extremely brown. We just re need to be sort of a nice sort of pale golden brown. And that's enough to give it a head start so that by the time uh, it gets into the oven, uh, everything's going to cook at the same rate. I'd, so I'd say a total of about five minutes in the skillet is what we're looking for. Someone can look at the time clock, you know, the time stamp of the video, and tell you exactly. I think in Daniel's recipe, it calls for about eight to ten minutes. Um, I, personally, I find that ends up being a little bit of an overkill. But, um, you know, you do you. You do what you feel like. Let Daniel do what he feels like. I think we're looking good. Okay, so that's the color we kind of got here, you see? Kind of pale golden brown all across the back, starting to crisp up nicely, right? And you can already see how much fat has rendered out from those holes we made. But now, at this point, the chicken, I'm gonna line it up with the pan handle just so that it's easier to keep track of in the oven as far as rotation goes. Um, and I'm gonna pop this into the toaster oven. 
Sorry, this is future me about to uh, throw that chicken into the oven, but um, I pulled it off for a second because I forgot to tell you, um, when you salt and when you salt your chicken, uh, you want to let it rest overnight in the fridge on a rack uncovered. And the idea is that you want the skin to dry out, uh, out a little bit, and that's going to help it um, crisp up a little bit more. You don't want to let it go more than, say, at most two nights. If you let it go longer than that, the skin will completely dry out. And without moisture, the collagen in skin cannot soften into gelatin. So it'll end up with a sort of leathery chicken as, as opposed to a crisp chicken. So for the crisp chicken, you want to salt it and let it rest overnight on a rack so that it uh, can dry out a little bit, but not too much. All right, back to the main part of the video. Before I pop that chicken in the oven, what I'm going to do is get a thermometer in there. So I'm using my combustion ink. This thermometer has multiple probes in it, so as long as it goes through kind of the thickest part of the chicken, it will basically figure out what the core temperature of the chicken is on its own and tell you how long it is going to take to uh, roast. I am also going to brush the chicken with some of its own rendered fat here. That's just going to help the breast uh, get a little bit golden brown more evenly. There's no need to baste poultry uh, as it roasts. Um, in fact, it's generally better not to base things because you end up just kind of cooling it down uh, as opposed to, well, I don't know, doing much more with it. Ba basing while roasting, that is. Um, and when you do base, if you are going to base, you definitely want to base with something that's like a pure fat as opposed to, you know, like butter, for example, has a mixture of fat and water. Uh, and you don't want to add water to the surface of your chicken. But the fat that's rendered off from the chicken already is a perfect basing thing. I'm going to do it once at the beginning, and that's it. Now, finally, it's going to go straight into a 425 degree oven. I'm using my toaster oven. With basic convection on, not sort of like the super convection, not the, uh, you know, like the um, air fryer settings or anything, just regular convection. That's going to help it brown more evenly. It's going to go in there until it hits uh, 150 degrees in the center of the breast. Uh, and at that point, I will take it out and it should be, let it rest and it should be done. I think it'll take around 40 minutes or so, but we will see. So I'll see you back in 50 minutes or so. Um, the chicken is very close to done, 148. It says there's 34 seconds left in the cook. Um, that thermometer, by the way, it uh, has active prediction of uh, when, the, when the food's going to be done. That's pretty accurate. Um, I decided because I have all that delicious chicken fat in there, I'm going to roast some potatoes. So I got these Yukon Golds. I'm going to put them in a pot with some water, give them a little parboil until they're soft, and then uh, after that I'm going to toss them with that chicken fat and roast them. They'll probably take longer to roast than uh, the chicken needs to rest, but that's all right. We'll, uh, we will gently reheat the chicken before dinner and it'll be just fine. I ended up cooking this chicken real early anyway because I wanted to shoot a video. I, I need to get, well, sort of wanted to shoot a video and also needed to get it done before uh, I go pick up my daughter from school. All right, we're at 150 degrees. Let's pull that chicken out. I did give it one rotation, uh, one rotation in the middle, I should say, uh, just to check it out and everything was looking good. Oh my goodness, look at that. Gorge, gorgeous. Now you can see it's out of the oven, but it's still continuing to rise in temperature. It's at uh, 153 right now. So I'm hoping it won't go above, you know, maybe 160 max. 155 would be ideal. It might go a little bit above that. Notice also I was roasting this at pretty high heat. Um, that's because I really want that skin to crisp up nicely. Let's check out how the bottom looks. Take this guy. Take this thermometer out. We're all done with you. You are hot. And my chicken. Ooh, you are pretty hot too. Look at how crispy that looks. Delicious. Ooh, there's a string stuck to you there. Wow. Uh, let's temp those legs real quick, actually. Let's see what uh, temp those legs are at. Make sure that we're actually at the, uh, you know, 175, 180. There we go. 170. Perfect. As long as we're above 165 on those, this one's at 180. You want to check sort of in the deepest part of the joint. 180, 186. Good. Legs are really hard to overcook. It's the breast that we mainly have to be worried about. And let's double check this part of the breast also. Let's get the thickest part. All right, 162. So I think we're good. Um, I'm going to let this chicken rest for a few minutes uh, while my potatoes continue to boil. And I'll just pour that chicken fat in here. So now I have something to roast my potatoes in.
I probably wouldn't even make a pan sauce with this because there's not really that much uh, that much fond in the pan. Hmm, those little bits are yummy though. Okay, so I'll be back in a few minutes. I'll show you how to how to uh, carve this chicken now that it's cooked. All right, I'll see you in. 20 minutes or so, uh, the chicken has rested, it's now ready to carve. I usually rest my chicken until it comes down to around um, 145 degrees or so. That's a sort of a good sign that uh, the juices in there have sort of redistributed and thickened up a little bit so they're not gonna come spilling out as soon as you uh, cut into the chicken. Although they might anyway, who knows. Um, all right, so I'm gonna undo this string. Because we only trust it the simple way, you don't really have to pull anything out from underneath. So it comes off, this string comes off really nice and easily. Okay, so now we start with the legs. So the first thing you wanna do is hold on to the end of the drumstick here, pull it out to the side a little bit, stretch out this little flap of skin, and then go give it a little incision just with the tip of your knife. You don't really have to do much work. The leg should sort of pull itself away, right? And just very gently with the tip of your knife start, start to sort of work it away until the leg basically pulls off on its own. And then you wanna get in that little joint there, make sure that you cut deep enough that you get the oyster. That's this little chunk of meat here right next to the back of the chicken. Okay, and there we got a leg. If you want, you can then divide it into a drumstick and a thigh portion. We'll do the same on this leg over here, so kind of gently pull it apart, slit. Very little pressure needed when you're when you're uh, cutting a chicken, carving a chicken. If you feel like you're having to like, like really have to saw through something, you're probably doing it wrong and you should readjust your knife position. So we got that oyster out along with the back. All right, again, we're gonna right through that joint. So we've got our two thighs and our two drumsticks. Now for the breasts. You can, of course, leave it on the bone if you want. Um, I'll probably just take it off. Uh, so if you were, I'll leave it, I'll take it off because I'm gonna make stock, but if you were to leave it on the bone, what you would do is you would hold it up like this and cut through here and basically cut down through the rib, break through the rib bones with your knife, and then you'll end up with a two chicken, a whole chicken breast that you can split in half with your knife. But we're gonna just take it right off the bone here. This is gonna be a little bit more difficult because I left the, um, I didn't remove the the, uh, the wishbone, which is the bone that comes up here before roasting it. If you wanna make your your job a little bit easier carving, you can take that wishbone out uh, while the chicken is still raw, uh, which will make it easier to carve. It's harder to take it out while it's raw, but you have the advantage that the chicken is cold so you can handle it more easily so you don't burn your fingers, you know? Um, but anyhow, I don't know if you saw what I just did. I worked my knife as close as I could to the bone here, and then I kind of separate it from this little bone that pops out, and then slid my life knife right down along the uh, inside of the carcass to get off as much meat as possible, leaving very little behind. Uh, and then I'm gonna split this breast into two pieces also, mainly because uh, um, I generally think those portions are too big, but also because I want you to see how juicy this is inside. Look at that. Look at that, can you see that? Can you see how juicy it is? A little squeezer. I don't like all those videos where people squeeze things, but uh, I don't know, I guess I just did it. All right, onto the plate it goes. You could take the wing off of that piece also if you want. Um, I always think, by the way, these little pieces of skin and stuff, those are chef treats. Chicken skin, it'll come out crispy out of the oven. It's never gonna be as crispy, um, you know, when you actually serve it as it was fresh out of the oven, same with turkey skin. That's just a fact of life no matter what anyone tells you. So you see, not much pressure, it kind of separates itself. And then when I get to the uh, bone part here, I kind of use my knife to just pry a little bit in there, and then it should pop right out. Okay. Again, let's take a look at, oh my, is that juicy. You know, chicken breast is actually, I prefer chicken breast to chicken leg when it's properly cooked, when it's really nice and juicy like this. I think there's nothing better, nothing better chicken-wise, at least. Mmm, all that crispy back skin. All right, mm. missed part of the oyster. So this is actually part of the first oyster. I think I missed a little bit of it, but also chef's treat. Jack Pepin's favorite part of the chicken. All right, so now this carcass, I will chop it up. I'll leave the herbs in there. I'll chop it up roughly. I'm gonna use it to make stock. Um, but there you have it. That is how you roast a chicken and how you get it really nice and juicy. 
So there you have it, like real simple, the simplest way I know how to roast a chicken and have it sort of come out whole looking like a chicken as opposed to spatchcocking it. Um, the key steps are salt it well, you add baking powder to the salt if you want, let it rest overnight in the fridge uncovered on a rack so that you get circulation all around and it dries the skin out a little bit. The next day, poke a bunch of holes in it with a skewer or a toothpick or anything really nice and sharp uh, all along the fat deposits on both sides, th both thighs and on the breast. Um, cut a couple slits in the back of the chicken. All of that allows for rendering fat channels to escape into the pan so it doesn't just in bubble under the skin. Um, and then finally, get your cast iron pan or any oven safe pan, nice and hot, a thin layer of oil, put the chicken in there with the back side down uh, after trussing it and then cook it uh, on the back as well as the sides where the thighs are just to give them a bump, a bump, a little head start before you throw the whole thing into a 425 degree oven convection if you got it. Uh, if you don't have convection, you can use a 450 degree oven. It'll take you around 40 minutes to an hour, depending on the size of the chicken. My chicken took actually 50 minutes. Um, you want to pull it out when it gets to 150 degrees, let it rest, carve it, and you will have the juiciest, most delicious roast chicken you have ever made. All right, so there you have it. Perfect roast chicken. Um, I am not going to feed any to Hamon right now because he's up in my wife's office. She's working, so I don't want to bother them, but he will get some at dinner. Um, before I go, real quick plug for my books. This is the Food Lab. This is my sort of big food science manual, a thousand pages, hundreds of recipes, lots of photos. Um, if you don't know much about cooking, this is a great place to start. If you do know a lot about cooking, this is a great place to advance to. Um, James Beard Award winning, lots of great reviews, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is my second book, The Walk. Uh, also, uh, award-winning, best-selling James Beard Award-winning book, um, all about the science and technique of cooking in a wok. Finally, Every Night is Pizza Night, also a best-selling, award-winning book. This is my children's book. It's not a cookbook, it's a storybook. It's great for kids three to eight years old or so. Um, it's about a girl who thinks pizza is the best food in the world, because it is. Um, all right, those are, that's my plug for the day. You can get any of those personalized, signed, uh, autographed. Uh, and sent to you anywhere in the world from Book Larder. I go in there once a month here in Seattle and send out books. So um, follow the link in the description below if you would like any of my books. That's how, you know, that's the best way to support my channel. All right, guys, gals, non-binary pals, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.